Okay, welcome back to video 5 in the building a real world application with the entity framework. It just so happens it's 6.0.2 where we're going to talk a little bit more about our business objects, but most of all we're going to talk about a dirty, dirty subject that developers don't much enjoy, and that is security. Now, I want to make the, as I've said in video 4, I want to make the middleware as API-ish as I can for any consuming application, whether it be WCF as a middleware endpoint or it's a Windows uh, Forms program, and that slick WPF program or a ASP.NET MVC, blah, 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 blah. You could go down the list and someone say, don't leave out Java and you could make web calls. Yep, you got it, all the above. <laughs> so the goal here is how do we do that and how do we make it to where it's transparent to the consumer, the consumer being that application? Well, I thought about it quite a bit and thought about it today. And I've used a solution in the past, and I decided to stick with it here. It's simple, it's quick, it's easy, uh, it's on the web, and it's been used over and over and over again. And it provides just enough security to, to make it hard for someone. They really have to be devoted to get your passwords. So let's go in and look at what we've got. First of all, remember that we've got nothing but a person with report entries, and that person has a manager, and they also have an email address, which is our login ID, and the password, which is what we're interested in encrypting. So that's what we're going to talk about. So how do you encrypt that and decrypt it and yet make it transparent to the end user? So let's dive right in and look at that. This is the data that's currently in my person object in the database, the person table. And you'll notice that the password is a bunch of garbage. At least to us it is. Uh, but to the program it makes perfect sense. <laughs> um, it is encrypted. It is done via the middleware and saved to the database. And the unit test, the test BLL, uh, bears this out. You're welcome to go look at the functions. We'll look at a couple. This video is going to be pretty short because it's the eve of the Super Bowl and tomorrow's a big day so gotta wake up early and do some Super Bowl tradition stuff so we'll just do a little bit here where we look at the person we talk mostly about the encryption and the security so let's look at the person object and how we actually do that so we're gonna go in here to the person object and you'll notice I've got this busted up into regions for you so it's easy to use it's checked in we know it builds I've tested it so I know it works and it's all on the SVN server, which if you look in the comments section, i tell you how to get that. And I've also got a link in this video at the beginning of the video and at the end of the video uh, to if there's another video after it, the video after it, to the first video if you just happen to jump on this channel in the middle, and it'll keep you on track. So I've got it busted in security, gets, saves, and conversions. We've talked in the past about conversions and how the conversion objects just take the entity framework objects and convert them into these data transfer objects which is the ones we actually use to transfer data between us and the client. Now we key these data transfer objects off the date entered because you certainly don't want to uh, send data with no start and no end so we have a start date and an end date and they can also uh, say if they want to deep load. Maybe they just want the list of people and they don't really care about loading up all those reports. So for performance reasons, we let them tell us if they want to deep load it. So lazy loading, I guess, is a uh, cooler way to say it. So let's look at the security here. You'll see I included the link to the uh, website that goes over this and it's, you know, it's been used a lot. Everything in here is static because I want them to be able to use it static, but we've got an encrypt and a decrypt method. And those encrypt and decrypt methods accept strings and they return a string that's either decrypted or encrypted. Inside it, we use the standard .NET. You'll look, if I look here, the system.security.cryptography. So we're using .NET integrated cryptography to do everything where it's bytes and bytes from strings and all of that stuff. You can read a lot more about it in the article. I'm not going to get too far in the weeds in it here. The thing to remember is string in gets decrypted and string in gets encrypted. And it works and it's fast and it's scalable. But it did necessitate a change in my password field from 50 characters 
to 500 characters. And I've updated the model in the database to, to represent that. And the reason I had to do that is, is because if you enter a 50 character password, then the password after it's encrypted is no longer 50 characters. But it will certainly be less than 500. So that's the reason for that change. So the next question was, where do we put this? Where's the best place in our object hierarchy to put this encrypt and decrypt? Well, you don't want it in 19 different places, right? So you had to find a choke point where everything went through. And it just so happens that everything goes through the convert to DTO or the convert to entity framework. Now, there's a couple of functions where we would need to encrypt the password prior to comparing it, such as the login. When someone logs in, they're going to send us a login, which is a username and password, which is not encrypted. So we need to take that password they send us, encrypt it, and then run our link statements to see if that username and password's in the database. And it just so happens, because of the cryptography, we do get case sensitivity out of our link statement, even if case sensitivity is not enabled in the database, which the use state, uh, user test shows. So let's look at that. Let's look at the security login. It's static, you know, there's everything here static. I don't know why I keep saying it, but everything is static. You send me a username and a password, and I'm going to send you back the person object that goes with that. Okay? So, and it's not going to be deep loaded. But, the passwords you send me, before we run the link, we need to encrypt it. And the encryption is always going to be the same because if we look at our encrypt and decrypt passwords, you can change this, of course. I just left it. Uh, there's an encrypt and decrypt password. You could come up with your own methods for storing that password. Uh, if you're going to scramble up the source code, it's not going to matter anyway, so I just left it. But make sure they match. That's the only thing to remember. So anyway... We're going to encrypt the password, and then what we're going to do is we're just going to go into the people, and we're going to look, and we're going to say where the email address is equal to the username you sent me, and the password, using the string.compare, is equal to the password, and we are case sensitive using the uh, English U.S. culture. Now. If the login is successful, we'll get what? An entity framework person object back. If it's not successful, we'll get null back. So, if it's not null, we know we got someone who's logged in. We've got a valid user. So we simply convert that user, tell it not to deep load, and we send the min values for your date times doesn't really matter. We could have used default parameters so we didn't have to send them. Uh, Mr. Skeet, who is a prominent writer, has uh, some very strong opinions about optional uh, parameters. I am just, for the sake of it, not going to use them in this in the convert methods. So I just send datetime.mins when I would normally just send a nothing and use a default parameter. So, But in this case, I'm not going to for readability and other reasons. And then we return that data transfer object which has been converted. So if we want to see how this works, we go over here to our person BLL and you say, well, Dean, how, how hard is this thing to use? Well, it's not. We test all our saves out here. Now, this is another thing worth noting. I made some changes since video four on the save. Uh, anytime you save new or you save an update, what's the first thing we need to check? Well, since our username is unique, we need to check, number one, if it's an update, that you haven't updated the username, the email, to an email that's already in the system. So we'll need to check for that. And if it is, we'll just throw an exception. And number two is if you're trying to insert a new person, make sure that the email address isn't already in the database. And you can look at that in the save event of the person. You can come up here to the person, 
go to the saves, come down here, and you can see where I'm doing that. The email taken. And there's a couple of different ways that we look for that. Person found. Okay. So let's get back to our test here. Especially for the login because we are focusing on security. And all we do is we try to log in with a invalid password. Log in with a case sensitive valid password. And then log in with an case non-valid password. Let's run it. And it, and it passed. We're good to go. So the login method works. We get back what we expect. The encryption works. We can see that here, that it encrypts the passwords. And life is good. So that's just a quick video on security. I wanted to put something out today. I was thinking about security a lot today and the easiest way to do this. Certainly I welcome your ideas and your inputs. Always trying to make these things better. I'm still tinkering with my Camtasia Studio 8.1 uh, rendering setting. So hopefully if you see a big drop off in quality, let me know on the rendering side. Uh, I'm limited to, I've got this beautiful Asus 27 Pro Art. So it always looks good on my size. I have to minimize it down to make it renderable and you can watch it. Uh, but uh, let me know if something doesn't sound right or if, or if something's good. But I do appreciate the questions. Uh, security questions came in. I got about five of them in two days uh, about how we were going to secure this thing up. And uh, one question John sent in. Uh, it's a great question. And it was talking about uh, SSL. And the question said, you know, if we encrypt in the database, do you still need to use SSL? And the answer is, if you're going across the Internet, yes. Uh, use something SSL or something like it. F5 networks, I mean, there's hardware-based devices. I mean, there's all kinds of things for encryption. I'm not going to get too far into that. Um, but if you're going over the Internet, you should, from your firewall to the client, still encrypt the data stream because they're sending you the username and password clear text over the web. Now, you may encrypt it once you compare it against your database, and your database very well is encrypted too, but the data flowing back and forth is not because we decrypt it prior to sending it over the wire. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so hopefully this helps. Please subscribe, support the channel, give it a thumbs up if you found it at all educational. And as always, thanks for stopping by and we'll see you next time.